day. Happy Eve of IUSB Spring Break, I should also say. It's, it's next week. The um, so things are getting quiet around here already, as I recall as an undergraduate. The weekend started on Wednesday. Am I saying too much about myself? Uh, it was true, though. Anyway, thank you for coming out to this week's installment of our Sustainability Innovation Lecture Series. It's a series of 10 talks. So we're actually in the second half, uh, well into the second half of this series. Um, and they are on all kinds of different topics. So this one, very different from last week, which was different than the week before that. So last week we were hosting some local business people talking about how to do business sustainably. Uh, so that was really interesting. This is not really going to be about that, but it's going to be about something completely <coughs> different, but equally interesting. So thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Krista Bailey. I'm the director of the Center for a Sustainable Future here at IU South Bend. Um, one of the things we do throughout the year is host this series, but lots of other things as well. We actually teach a lot of sustainability classes and do workshops in the community as well, and a lot of other outreach in the community. Uh, but you may have noticed walking in, one, we've got a whole list of the stuff that's still yet to come in the series. Uh, so if you're curious about what's already happened, uh, or what is coming, please pick one up, pass it along, and share it. Uh, we are recording this session, uh, so we do have some people uh, attending virtually, uh, either students in uh, classes here or people from the community, so there's that. Uh, so that said, you may also hear when it's time for asking questions that there'll be a voice from above uh, that's probably just someone from the community or from a class asking a question. I say probably, because that's what I'm guessing uh, will happen. So just a heads up on that. Um, so this material is out there. Uh, and if you missed one, they're on our YouTube channel. So you can find Sustain the Future on YouTube and see these talks that already happened. Uh, let's see, what else? If this intrigues you, or you think it would intrigue somebody else that you know, and you want to learn more about sustainability, there's also materials that look kind of like this out on the table. This is about our sustainability studies program here on campus. So we do offer undergraduate uh, major minor uh, degrees and a graduate certificate in strategic sustainability leadership. So if you or someone you know is interested, feel free to pick up one of these or take a snapshot, look it up, whatever you'd like to do. So that is uh, also out there out front. Um, there, of course, is information that our speaker brought available to you, so I'll let him talk more about that. Um, but speaking of talking more about things sustainability related, we always start these series with an opportunity not just for you to hear from the speaker, and definitely really not to hear from me. I'm just here to welcome you but to help build our sustainability community here in Michiana, we'd like to give you a chance to find out who else is in the room, who else came because they were interested in this thing. Uh, so we always uh, take a couple minutes at the beginning of each talk for you before we sit here for a while in these chairs to stand up out of your seat, go meet somebody that you don't know, exchange names, tell them why you came to this, um, and get to know somebody else that came here tonight. Um, our speaker will even be participating. Uh, so please, take a few minutes, get up, uh, find out who else is here, introduce yourself to someone you don't know, find out why they're here, and uh, those those <laughs> yeah. right. And I am
had an affinity for science, largely thanks to uh, teachers that inspired me to uh, enjoy chemistry and biology and geology, uh, to the point when I got into college at St. Joseph's College, I decided to major in chemistry. And then the second semester of my freshman year, I took an environmental science course. It was a kind of a general environmental uh, studies class. And that intrigued me to change my major to environmental science. And uh, long story short, I graduated with a group major in biology and geology, minor in chemistry. And uh, once I graduated, I went into environmental consulting, which is a pretty common uh, profession for people with an environmental science degree. I did that for a couple years, ended up getting my MBA at IUN uh, over in Gary, Indiana University Northwest. And uh, as I was working on my MBA, I learned about Shirley Hines Land Trust. And uh, lo and behold, they were uh, hiring for an executive director. I applied for the job and still kind of to my dismay, uh, even today, 13 years later, uh, they hired. So uh, I've been there since 2005. And it's really been uh, a wonderful organization to work for. Uh, hopefully you'll see that as I get into uh, what it is that uh, we do as an organization. Before I talk about Shirley Hines Land Trust, so I just want to paint a little bit of a picture about the uh, land trust community in the United States. So uh, they're um, land trusts are nonprofit organizations. Many of you are probably familiar with the Nature Conservancy. They're actually a worldwide uh, nonprofit uh, land trust. And land trusts do uh, two things. They acquire land. They can do that uh, by purchasing the land, owning it outright, or uh, through conservation easements. So depending on what type of land trust um, you're dealing with, um, they might uh, do one or both of those types of uh, land protection. And then there's also this stewardship component or land management piece. Uh, Shirley Hines, uh, you'll see in my presentation, uh, we do a lot of uh, pretty intensive land management where we actually have staff that go out and, and manage the properties we protect. So 1,300 land trusts, you see in parentheses there, 398 accredited land trust. Uh, there is a consortium group known as Land Trust Alliance that serves uh, the whole land trust community. And they have an accreditation program so that uh, land trusts are adhering to uh, sound uh, land acquisition and land strategy practices, and that they're, they're also uh, strong uh, nonprofit organizations. And even though I haven't got into what Shirley Hines Land Trust is and does, uh, you see the uh, logo there in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, I'm here to let you know that we are a, an accredited land trust and we achieved that last year. So we're one of three accredited land trusts in the state of Indiana. And uh, you can see the statistics up there, over 56 million acres of land protected by land trusts in the United States. 140,000 acres by the 22,000 land trusts, or excuse me, the 22 land trusts in Indiana. So, uh, who is Shirley Hines? Uh, Shirley Hines was a spectacular woman. She uh, lived in Ogden Dunes, uh, a community, a lakefront community uh, on the very southern tip of Lake Michigan. Uh, she was a psychologist and a professor. And unfortunately, uh, in her early 50s, she passed away of lymphoma. Uh, but she had such a profound impact on a family, uh, the Seidner family, uh, Robert and Betty Lou Seidner. And so when uh, Shirley Hines passed away, they decided to memorialize her and her appreciation for nature. And they did so with a $30,000 gift. And that's what got Shirley Hines Environmental Fund started in 1981. Uh, so you can see the mission of the organization up there. It's changed slightly over time, but ultimately what we're doing is we're protecting, acquiring, and restoring habitats and ecosystems in northwestern Indiana. Um, and we are doing all of this for everyone here and uh, future generations as well. Uh, and we work really, really hard and have uh, become uh, 
more and more effective over the years at uh, inspiring and educating uh, children and adults about the value of these high quality natural areas. This map is a nice visual depiction of all the uh, spectacular places we've protected. Uh, you can see the counties uh, depicted in the map uh, right behind me on three screens. Um, historically, the organization really focused on the southern Lake Michigan watershed. I don't know if you can see this uh, uh, green dot very well, but uh, the stuff that's highlighted in the northern part of Lake Porter and Lahore County is where most of our land holdings are located. And historically, when we got started, our focus was on the southern Lake Michigan watershed. So just think of that as all the water that drains into Lake Michigan in those three counties. Uh, the stuff in the southern portion of those counties uh, drains to the Kankakee River, uh, which is that uh, kind of crooked line uh, and the southern boundary of Lake Porter and Laporte. So historically, we were just in those three counties. And uh, back in, it was around 2008, there was uh, an initiative undertaken by Indiana Land Protection Alliance, or ILPA. And that is a consortium group, a statewide consortium group for land trusts. And they wanted to assure that every county in the state of Indiana, all 92 counties, had an active land trust. And it just so happened, um, after organizations volunteered for, for some counties that weren't covered, the three remaining counties were uh, St. Joseph, Stark, and Marshall County. And so Shirley Hines uh, kind of cautiously raised our hands and said we would be receptive to taking on those counties over time. and. Uh, and we eventually did that, as you'll uh, see later on in the presentation. Uh, so we have uh, 22 uh, project areas. Uh, the black dots uh, reflect uh, our uh, large land holdings that uh, many of them are accessible to the public. Some are in the process of being made accessible to the public. And in that key to the right, where it says conservation areas, you can get a sense of the different types of habitat. So starting uh, in Lake County, you have dune and swale. Uh, and as you work your way uh, eastward uh, towards St. Joseph County, you have uh, coastal dunes. There's a spectacular place uh, we refer to as Hobart Marsh in Hobart. Uh, you have the moraine. The moraine is the gl uh, glacial till material that was uh, left behind during the last glaciation period. So you get, uh, it's forested, uh, lots of ravines uh, and streams, and it's kind of upland uh, habitat. And then as you get over into St. Joseph County, uh, it's more woodlands and you have uh, cattle lakes. And while we're on this slide, I'll just say that uh, to date, we have protected just over 2,400 acres, most of which has been through uh, fee simple acquisition, just like if you were to buy your house. So Shirley Hines owns um, just very close to uh, 2,300 acres, and then we have a little over 100 acres in conservation easement. And if you're not familiar with what a conservation easement is, that's where a land trust like Shirley Hines would place a permanent easement uh, with restrictions on property that someone still owns and retains an interest in. Uh, so let's say you have a beautiful, spectacular uh, property that you want to permanently protect from development and uh, you want to uh, assure that that uh, resource is always there, uh, then you could work with an organization such as ours to uh, get a conservation easement. It's not something that we typically do, but in uh, unique cases, um, or certain cases, uh, we will. And the reason why we prefer to own the property is because that allows us to uh, manage the property uh, with our stewardship program. So now I'm going to just kind of go through a couple different habitat types uh, and get into a little more detail about those uh, conservation areas you saw on the previous map. Um, Ivanhoe South is in Gary, Indiana. It's a globally rare dune and swale habitat. 
It is um, uh, the dunes essentially are, uh, and you can kind of see it a little bit on uh, the aerial map. Uh, those are kind of the brown lines, and then the green lines or dark lines are the wetlands. So you get kind of this a uh, dune uh, swale, which is wetlands, dune swale, dune swale topography. It's very unique to the area. It's just um, at the very southern uh, shores of Lake Michigan and Gary and Hammond. Uh, the red, Ivanhoe South, is owned by Shirley Hines. That's about 50 acres. And then to the north, the Nature Conservancy has 90 acres. So it's a spectacular uh, dune and swale complex that requires pretty intensive management just because you have wetlands you're managing and, and also upland dunes that require uh, prescribed burn management or fire. I mentioned uh, just briefly uh, Hobart Marsh. Uh, we have several nature preserves in the vicinity of uh, Hobart and uh, work with several of our partners. There's actually a piece of a disjunct piece of the Indian Dunes National Lakeshore known as Hobart Prairie Grove. And then DNR, uh, Division of Nature Preserves, has uh, uh, an extremely high quality oak savanna that they permanently protected, uh, known as McCluskey Savanna. And then a few of our larger preserves in that area are highlighted uh, Gordon and Bait Griner, uh, Burrow Woods, and Crestmore Prairie. Uh, just while I'm on this, uh, Gordon and Faith Griner, uh, that name, uh, that preserve was named in memory of uh, Gordon and Faith who left the organization a sizable bequest in the mid 90s, actually totaling $860,000. So going back to that uh, $30,000 gift we received in 1981, um, we were pretty much a volunteer organization. And then in the mid-90s, we received, I mean, that's a significant bequest, as you can imagine. And um, that really uh, jump-started, in a lot of ways, our ability to acquire some of these larger project areas, like uh, Crestmore Prairie, you see uh, to the right, which um, I will talk about here in a second. But um, it allowed us to pick up significant uh, acreage uh, in the three county area at the time and also hire an executive director. So that's when we kind of went into uh, becoming a staff organization. And we started administering these uh, large grants that brought a lot of uh, resources to the Southern Lake Michigan watershed for acquisition and restoration. They were $1 million grants uh, that we administered. Crestmore Prairie that you just saw uh, depicted on that aerial is the largest remaining black soil prairie of its type. So it's only 43 acres in size, uh, but it has, uh, it exemplifies what you would expect to see in a tall grass prairie. Hundreds of native plants uh, and just uh, really a spectacular place. And in addition to the complexity of this geography that we have, which is one of the most biodiverse places in the country, you have where the prairies uh, from the west kind of collided with the forests from the northeast. So you have lots of prairies, forests, and there's just kind of a high concentration of different habitats in this area. And so hopefully you get a good sense of the different stuff that we have in this region. Beverly Shores, this is in that, uh, that dunes region. Uh, it's actually uh, the properties you see uh, highlighted in yellow there are over 300 lots that we acquired uh, at tax sales. Uh, they were donated to the organization. And it has taken us about a little, pretty close to 35 years to permanently protect a little over 80 acres. Uh, and this is extremely high quality marsh. It's adjacent to the Indian Dunes National Lakeshore, uh, just to the south, and you can see uh, Lake Michigan in the picture there. So if you're familiar with kind of that town of Porter Chesterton area in Porter County, uh, this is just to the north. And Beverly Shores is another one of those lakeshore communities like Ogden Dunes. 
and we're doing a lot of restoration of the site in partnership uh, with the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. Meadowbrook, uh, this is a pretty spectacular place. Uh, it's actually where we're headquartered today. In 2013, we picked up a retired Girl Scout camp that was 74 acres in size. And at the time, and as you may know, um, Girl Scouts and Cub Scouts um, have let go of uh, some of their uh, camps. And it just so happened that uh, Meadowbrook Girl Scout camp um, came up for sale, we partnered with them. We were able to leverage this Bicentennial Nature Trust uh, funding program that was established by Governor Daniels. It made, that Bicentennial Nature Trust program made $30 million in total available for land protection in the state of Indiana. And it was tied into the Bicentennial in 2016, and it made uh, the acquisition of Meadowbrook possible. So you can see, that house there, it's about 4,000 square feet. We use most of the office space with our staff. We also uh, have some tenants, uh, the Wildlife Habitat Council that works with uh, uh, corporations and industry, and then also the Northwest Indiana Paddling Association uh, uses the facilities. And then you see there the uh, trail guide. There's about five miles of trails at that site. And of all the properties we have, it's, it's probably uh, the most uh, accessible. There's a nice parking lot. There's some good interpretive signage. And I urge all of you to make a trip to uh, Valparaiso to check this out. And so we acquired the uh, Girl Scout camp in 2013. In 2014, we would add 80 acres, and then we leveraged those acquisition dollars to secure a large-scale grant to plant 20,000 trees on the property. So our focus here, uh, Meadowbrook being kind of right in the heart of the moraine, is converting it uh, back to moraine forest. So you can see uh, to the right uh, the open ag fields, uh, and there we planted uh, approximately 20,000 trees in 2015. So it was the largest reforestation project in northern Indiana at the time. Ambler Flatwoods, uh, this is uh, probably our most prized possession uh, when you think of all the habitats uh, we have protected, maybe with the exception of the bog here in South Bend that I'll get to. Uh, but What's so spectacular about Ambler is uh, you can't find uh, boreal flatwoods uh, really anywhere else in the state of Indiana where it's protected uh, at the scale we've been able to protect it. There's uh, approximately 500 acres of land permanently protected in this area. And what's so unique about uh, boreal flatwoods is uh, Boreal is a species that you would find in northern latitudes. And uh, in Michigan City, it just so happens, or at Ambler Flatwoods, uh, those boreal species are at the very southern range. So you wouldn't find them anywhere else in the state of Indiana. And you get uh, ephemeral ponds, uh, you get these beautiful kind of seasonal wetland areas, and then the flatwoods part of it is uh, you know, you get uh, forested areas that are uh, extremely diverse, and again, uh, lots of species that you would find up in Michigan and even up in Canada. The map to the left is we undertook uh, our first ever conservation planning initiative in 2008. And that's where we looked at the property that we had permanently protected, and at that time it was about 200 acres and we prioritize properties as boreal flatwoods habitat, potential to be boreal flatwoods habitat, or buffer. And so the map there, if uh, you were looking at it a little more closely, it kind of uh, prioritizes parcels as such. And what we did is we created a brochure, we sent it to landowners, and it ultimately resulted in us being able to protect another 150 acres uh, at that time. So, uh, and then, uh, since then, we've been gradually adding pieces, uh, getting to the 500 acres we have today. Ambler, 
uh, Crestmore, and a few other sites uh, that I didn't point out um, because I don't want to just talk about land protection the whole time are state dedicated nature preserves. And they're state dedicated because they resemble uh, the highest quality type of habitat for boreal flatwoods or prairie or in some cases savanna. So uh, we're very proud of the fact that we, we have five <coughs> state dedicated nature preserves as an organization. And that essentially, uh, going back to that conservation easement model I mentioned, that's where the state of Indiana puts a permanent conservation easement on our land. So even though we're a land trust and our mission is to permanently protect property, we are still um, required to uphold the conservation values of those sites uh, by the state of Indiana. And that conservation planning effort uh, organically over time led to um, much bigger uh, conservation uh, strategies uh, for our organization and partners. Uh, this uh, project here uh, is the Little Calumet River Corridor or the east branch of the Little Calumet River. And it is, you can see kind of on that map there, the dark green is permanently protected land. Um, uh, largely the Indian Dunes National Lakeshore, uh, the disjunct uh, portion, which I can kind of point to here in the middle of that dark blue line that goes through the middle of the map, that's the river corridor, uh, that's the Heron Rookery, and land owned by DNR. And then when you get into the lighter green, those are uh, properties that uh, Shirley Hines has been working diligently to protect. So it's either um, uh, uh, emergent marsh or uh, floodplain forest. And we uh, took on a pretty big undertaking in, uh, in line with that Bicentennial Nature Trust initiative, uh, where the state of Indiana had various conservation areas throughout the state. And this uh, little cow corridor ended up becoming one of those conservation areas, and we were able to protect 400 acres. So it's very exciting, and it's uh, it takes uh, land protection to a different level within our organization and with a lot of our partners because we are essentially using the river corridor to protect uh, disjunct properties and. Our goal is to protect that whole entire river corridor. And if you look at the picture, you can see, if you look very closely, kind of a red splotch, that's actually uh, someone kayaking on the river. Uh, this uh, river has not been, uh, up until a couple years ago, had not been used for canoeing and kayaking uh, in over 30 years. So we work, we've been working with the Northwest Indiana Paddling Association to remove lots and lots of log jams and we're excited there's now uh, six miles of navigable uh, river uh, stream to, that we can uh, paddle. The Myrna J. Nugent Nature Preserve, uh, you're looking at uh, Blue Eyed Mary. This is a recent acquisition. Uh, NIPSCO helped us with this uh, significantly, and it, it's really a nice uh, forested area just south of Rolling Prairie. And then, um, and what uh, I'm sure many of you are interested in learning more about is Lydic Bog. This is a site that's uh, very close to the South Bend Airport, kind of uh, northwest of uh, South Bend, and it is 176 acres in size. It includes a rare uh, and unique bog that was discovered by Steve Sass and Scott Namasnick. Uh, the bog itself, uh, we're still in the process of protecting. It's kind of along the, uh, the western edge of the property. And in addition to the bog, there is uh, these really spectacular uh, forested islands and ridges. You also have uh, some nice ephemeral wetlands on the property. Uh, you can see to the kind of northeast uh, the cross-hatched area is ag land uh, that we're in the process and will be converting back to forest uh, over the course of the next year. And I'll talk a little bit more about light of fog in a minute. But the one thing that's really 
neat about the pictures on the left, you can see a tamarack tree in the top left picture. That's kind of the pine tree. Um, and that's something you would expect to see in a bog. Uh, you have poison sumac. And there is also a nice aerial image of the log itself. And the one really cool plant is uh, it's a purple pitcher plant. It's a carnivorous plant that actually is a carnivorous plant. So <laughs> it eats flies. So getting into some of our programmatic activities, I spent a lot of time talking about the acquisition and protection piece. Uh, stewardship is where we uh, expend a lot of energy and resources, uh, so maintaining uh, these high quality natural areas, uh, planting natives. Uh, we, uh, as you can see there in the picture, uh, planting sedges in the Great Marsh. You have a uh, yellow lady slipper, uh, butterfly weed, uh, swamp milkweed, and just uh, when it comes to biodiversity, you know, being able to uh, maintain the biodiversity at these sites uh, that has positive implications on insects, amphibians, mammals, birds. Uh, it uh, benefits the whole uh, ecosystem. The painful part about uh, land management is removing um, invasive plants. So purple loosestrife uh, uh, is a big issue. Uh, when you get into forested areas, you have things like bush honeysuckle and multiflora rose that take a lot of time and energy to remove. Uh, and there's various techniques. Uh, so in some cases, we do use uh, herbicide. Uh, in other cases, uh, we may actually cut down trees and thin out a canopy in an oak savanna that's being overgrown because it's been fire suppressed. And then, and then actually put fire on the ground um, so that we can uh, remove the brush in the understory. And also, uh, there are certain plants that require that fire, uh, and, and it actually uh, helps them. <coughs> Environmental education, uh, this is something we've gotten into uh, more and more over the years. Uh, there's a great partnership known as the Northwest uh, Indiana Mighty Acorns Partnership. It's where we work with the Field Museum, and the Dunes Learning Center. The Dunes Learning Center is based in the uh, Indian Dunes National Lakeshore. It's a residential uh, camp for kids. Uh, and there's also a tall tree arboretum just south of Valparaiso. We work in partnership to provide curriculum to uh, kids, mostly elementary kids, third, fourth, and fifth grade, uh, where we get the kids out for field trips. Their teachers do pre and post field trip work with them in the classroom and they learn about native plants, invasive plants, uh, the web of life. And it's really been uh, an important program. Uh, and we're serving close to 3,000 kids a year uh, with that program. And then there's other environmental education programs uh, that we uh, work to uh, engage and get uh, students into as it relates to middle school and high school. And then when you get into college level, we do internships. There's a program called the Great Lakes. Uh, uh, it's called GLSEN, is the acronym. And it's uh, Great Lakes Innovative Stewardship Through Education Network. So that's a long acronym, but it's been tremendous for us because every year we have two to five college interns that actually go out on our preserves with our stewardship staff and do land. More recently, we um, launched a uh, volunteer program. Uh, so I urge all of you to grab a volunteer booklet, which talks about ways you can get involved with Shirley Hines. And it's, the program is really focused on creating site stewards for all these properties we're protecting, and uh, a, more of a culture of stewardship uh, in this region. So uh, we would love to have uh, we have volunteer work days regularly. You can check those out on our website. And it's a lot of fun because you get to know other people that have an interest in conservation. There's a few people working at some of our sites. I talked a little bit about public access. Um, 
If you go back 10 years, 15 years, we just didn't have the capacity as an organization to install parking lots, interpretive signage, uh, create trails, and we continue to work really hard at this. We have a long way to go, but uh, places like Meadowbrook and, and other sites are accessible to the public where you can literally uh, pull in and get out of your car and have a spectacular uh, experience on one of our nature preserves. And the other great thing about it is our properties are, they're open to the public and there's no charge. So um, that's definitely a benefit. Real quickly, I wanted to just kind of go back to lighting. Um, we, I, I mentioned the, the different types of habitats uh, briefly and uh, what hopefully all of you will be seeing soon and that we're working diligently on is creating uh, more public access at the site. So uh, we, we acquired the bog and then last year we actually picked up a two acre uh, homestead with a lot of dilapidated structures and so we're working to secure grant funds uh, to remove those dilapidated structures, install a parking lot, signage, and um, have it set up so that people can have a great experience and, and enjoy the site. So those signs don't exist yet. That's what we envisioned in the coming. Uh, and we're working on it. We're really happy uh, to announce that we received a $25,000 challenge grant from the Community Foundation of St. Joseph County to uh, work towards making those improvements. And now, uh, I just wanted to talk briefly about a couple other ways that we are uh, partnering and working specifically in St. Joseph County. Uh, the BOG was our uh, biggest step towards uh, advancing our mission in St. Joseph County. And it's not just uh, Shirley Hines uh, Land Trust, it's uh, St. Joseph County Parks, uh, MACOG, uh, Michiana Area Council of Governments, and many other partners, as Krista mentioned, she's a part of our advisory council. We have uh, many people from the uh, St. Joseph County community serving on that advisory council where we meet and we talk about conservation priorities. We're also uh, giving you a little sneak peek at some conservation planning work we're doing uh, with our partners. Uh, we have um, been focused on looking at uh, the uh, natural resources around Lydic Bog, um, Elbel, or Mud Lake, which is north of Lydic Bog and uh, in that kind of line of Kettle Lakes that goes down to the Kankakee. And then um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Spicer Lake and Bendix Woods, both county parks here in St. Joseph County, and then Potato Creek, which is a little further south, and Potato Creek is a um, DNR state uh, uh, preserve. So the map to the left shows the different natural areas we're targeting, and the map to the right is just a zoomed in version of Lydic Bog, where we're identifying baseline information of what's wetlands, what has been permanently protected, and uh, from there we'll continue to work with our partners to uh, prioritized properties, similar to what you saw in that uh, Ambler Flatwoods conservation planning map where we're looking at, okay, what's high, medium, or uh, low priority. And then last year, we launched our Bringing Nature Home Awards program. This is something that, it's an awards program where we are promoting uh, native plants to institutions and residents. So, if uh, IU South Bend has a native plant garden, they could apply to um, this program and potentially receive an award. So it's really exciting. And um, St. Joseph County Parks and Shirley Hines Land Trust uh, launched that in St. Joseph County last year. So how am I doing on time? A few minutes? Close? OK, so I'll just spend. Um, maybe uh, three more minutes, uh, giving you a quick overview of the organization uh, and maybe to avoid a few questions or address a few questions. A lot of people ask about uh, organizational capacity. 
And um, just to give you a little sense, we have an 18 member board. Uh, as with most nonprofit organizations, the board organizations, uh, the board is focused on uh, fundraising, uh, uh, governance, uh, finance, uh, our programs and strategies. And then uh, I have given up their, their time and talent. We have a very active board. Uh, the advisory council, we have 45 members. They serve as advisors to the organization, and uh, they are instrumental to helping us advance our mission. Uh, staff, hopefully you like that picture. That is um, our last staff retreat. We all became uh, CPR uh, certified. Uh, so if anyone collapses, I'm here to help. <laughs> Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen, but um, we have six full-time staff, uh, four uh, permanent part-time employees, and then we have lots of uh, seasonal technicians, assistants, largely uh, those are grant-dependent positions, and then I mentioned interns earlier. Uh, donors and volunteers uh, are critical to uh, who we are and what we do. And then one thing that I can't uh, say enough about is partnerships. Uh, Shirley Heinz Land Trust uh, really uh, values and um, is engaged in partnerships across the board with uh, corporations, uh, institutions. I mentioned the Field Museum earlier, universities, uh, and really pretty much all of the environmental organizations, and even beyond that, uh, federal government, state government, uh, county and local municipalities. We have relationships with almost uh, all of those uh, entities uh, in the geography that we serve. And everything we do is really driven by a five-year strategic plan. Uh, this just gets into uh, some of the growth areas for our current strategic plan from 2016 to 2020. Accreditation I mentioned, uh, geographic expansion is something that we're working on and focused on. Um, I mentioned the volunteer leader program. Uh, we have a goal of protecting 3,000 acres, uh, which is a significant increase uh, from where we were just uh, a few years ago, where we uh, had 1,000 acres, and now today we're at 2,400 acres. So um, that is uh, a goal of ours by 2020. And then also really working to expand public access and our education programming so that Again, we're uh, educating more students and adults and children, and uh, then developing long-term financial strength. And I won't bore you with more than that on the strategic planning front. And this is maybe a nice segue into uh, back to Krista and the sustainability program here at IUSB. Uh, why uh, Shirley Hines does all the wonderful things it does and how that benefits uh, all of us from a biodiversity standpoint, environmental sustainability, you know, the social, economic, uh, and uh, biological uh, benefits that you get from having these natural areas. So, and then there's um, how to get more involved. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet over there on the table. Uh, we urge you to sign up, get our newsletter. We do a monthly e-blast. Uh, we have lots of volunteer work days, uh, tell a friend. We have hikes, so you can learn about uh, these particular uh, sites from time to time, depending on where the hikes are. We do bus tours where we take people all over northwestern Indiana uh, to learn about our mission and uh, hear from geologists and botanists and people that are experts in different aspects of uh, the work we do. And of course, uh, you know, people uh, donating and volunteering to the organization. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Krista, or however you would like to proceed. Thank you. to one of the Shirley Hines Land Trust properties before? Uh, like, uh, a 
hand, literally a handful of it. So, okay, great. Um, how many of you are aware of the kind of biodiversity that we have in the state, or I really just in the region, is all we are really talking about? A few more, almost two handfuls. Awesome. <laughs> well, I wanted to kind of get a feel for what people already knew because you mentioned, uh, you kind of threw it off as sort of this, what I thought a very stunning piece of information. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about it. You said, um, and I can't remember which property it was. I couldn't, I thought it was looking fast enough. Um, one of the most biodiverse areas in the country is what you said. Yeah. Right here in our backyard, one of the most biodiverse areas in the country. And I think a lot of times we look around and we go, eh, it's up in Michigan or whatever. It's, it's the stuff that I know and I'm used to seeing it and all that. And I know I say that a lot. We live in the most, one of the most biodiverse places in the country and that's amazing and incredible and people don't know about it. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about um, the property you were mentioning and why that is so special and um, how you're helping to get people to understand more about it. Yeah, so um, as it relates to the biodiversity, and um, it's, it's broadly speaking, uh, so uh, when you think of the Indian Dunes National Lakeshore, right, that's like the highest quality um, natural areas in the dunes region uh, that we have. And so some of the properties that Shirley Hines has protected are extremely biodiverse and, and fit into that uh, broader kind of regional uh, biodiversity equation. So. Um, there's a few other places like the Great Smoky Mountains, for example. In terms of it's uh, much more vast, there's more acres, uh, it probably would tick up a little bit higher in terms of biodiversity, but when you look at uh, the all of the different uh, habitats and ecosystems we have here and how it is, I mean, we are kind of in a fragmented place, right? And there is um, uh, such a high concentration of um, plants in such a small area, that's kind of what makes it the most biodiverse. So uh, going back and as I was kind of going through all of those different habitats, uh, you just don't find that type of concentration and because we have so many different habitats in this region that kind of makes it conducive for uh, so many different uh, types of plants and animals. So you really have to get out and explore some you of this do. because yeah. you're going to drive two miles down the road and be in a completely different world. Yes, yeah. So like that Hobart Marsh area that uh, had lots of different properties, there's, some, there's savanna, there's uh, wetlands, there's marsh, and there's places like Crestmore Prairie, just in a very uh, you know, small geography, you have all those different habitats that are conducive for just many different types of species. Yeah. And there's information on how to follow. Yes. Um, so in, in terms of us getting out, and there was you know, a handful or so of people that have actually seen some of this and recognized this, um, and what we can do as individuals to start learning and exploring more. I was really intrigued by how you started out your talk tonight. So I've heard you present a few times. And you always start out talking about, here's Shirley Hines. Here's this one person. Mm -hmm. Why do you always tell the story of what this one person did? Because then you go on to talk about, you know, beautiful pictures of biodiversity and blah, 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 blah. But you always start with this story about, here's one person mm -hmm. and why one person matters. I wonder if you can... Help yeah. understand why you always start there, besides the fact that her name is important. Yeah, I think it's a couple different things. Uh, actually, when I first started at Shirley Hines, that was kind of an afterthought. And every once in a while, at the end of a presentation, someone would say, who is Shirley Hines? And um, I think over time, uh, the organization and you know myself and people involved you know, we've really grown to appreciate the impact this one person had on the organization. I, I mean, it was uh, her uh, passion and interest in the environment that spurred uh, a friend or friends to uh, memorialize her with a significant gift. And they, Shirley Hines inspired them because uh, she had such a passion for the environment and uh, the surrounding area. So I think it does, um, even though uh, Shirley Hines had no clue uh, that uh, 
a land trust would exist in her memory, I think it says a lot about the, the power any one of us can have uh, and you don't ultimately know what the end result might be. And so I think that's uh, inspiring to us as an organization. I think it's a, a story that, that should be told. Well, I love that. Keep, keep telling it. I think it's a great thing. Um, and I guess getting around to what we can do, um, we do have a, a, a live ball here. Um, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about um, when we could maybe tour live ball. Anyone want to go? Anyone been out there besides me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's, it's really. I was very much struck by the little gems in the in the woodland, and then of course there's the bog, and it's it's really amazing. But are there tours coming up? How about volunteer work days? You know, how can we connect in our county with what we're doing? If you could talk about what our individual action could be with the organization. Yeah. So. And then I'm going to stop asking questions, and you guys can ask questions. That's my list. Yeah. So with Lydic Bog, a big uh, challenge for us is access. So everybody wants to go see the bog. And um, it just so happens that uh, a bog, you have this you know, nice vegetative mat that is essentially surrounded by a moat. So um, that moat is not something you can just walk across. And so as it relates to guided hikes and tours of the bog specifically, we have some work to do as it relates to infrastructure. Um, and then on the, the volunteer uh, workday front, we are, um, last year we had an event out there. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone knows Doug Botka. He's our, one of our stewardship technicians from South Bend, and he's done a lot of spectacular work out there already. Uh, so if you're interested in volunteering, uh, we can definitely connect you with Doug. And we will be having more volunteer work days. We don't have anything specifically on the calendar at this moment. Uh, and then uh, there is a nice flyer over there that has upcoming events. Uh, there's nothing specifically for Light Log on that, but this summer, probably late summer, we'll be doing a community hike where we uh, give everyone an update and offer tours of the property. I'm not guaranteeing we'll be able to get you out to the bog, but the property has so many spectacular attributes that uh, I urge all of you to get out there. So uh, that one's a work in progress for us, and we will continue to work diligently to get good public access. So, uh, I'm going to stop talking. I really am. And let you guys ask questions. I'm sure you, there's some things you'd like to find out more about. So I'm just going to let you uh, field questions for a little while. OK. Sounds good. Yes. Uh, knowing that that has a very high concentration of industrial everything, how do you garner cooperation with them to, I mean, their actions of dumping? And, you know, how do you get that to not affect your mm -hmm. Sites. Yeah, so we um, we have been fortunate where you know um, we haven't had any like hazardous spill or environmental issues that have been negatively impacted any of our properties. Um, and in fact, um, a lot of the properties we have protected are uh, a credit, and in some ways, we have been beneficiaries as an organization of mitigation projects um, where uh, an organ a, a company may need to mitigate and then we can permanently protect a piece of property uh, or even use those mitigation dollars to uh, restore land. For example, like a clog, we you know, were able to plant trees and do a large scale restoration project uh, with dollars that are being made available to us. Um, the uh, there's a couple of programs out there that I didn't mention that have been tremendous for our stewardship program. One is Sustain Our Great Lakes. Uh, it's administered by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And for those of you that um, I know steel is a topic of conversation right now with tariffs, but um, ArcelorMittal uh, is uh, a major employer in steel company over in Northwest Indiana. And 
they uh, do a significant amount uh, to make that program possible. So, so I would say that by and large, our relationship with industry uh, has been positive and it has helped us advance our mission in lots of different ways. Uh, and it's evolved over time, not specifically with our organization, but just the dynamics between environment and industry, I think it's much more collaborative by and large than what it was 30 or 40 years ago. You said that group was called Sustainer. Sustain Our Great Lakes, yeah. And that's, uh, it, it's largely a program to fund uh, restoration throughout the Great Lakes region. Uh, and it has been extremely valuable uh, in terms of allowing us to advance our stewardship program at Sherlock Holmes. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd, say, I'd, I'd like to say thank you for the Sherlock Holmes part. Uh, the video, The Power of One, is called, is called. Very inspiring. I believe you can get it on YouTube, The Power of One. Um, I encourage you all to check that out. It fits very well with, with Sherlock Holmes, but what one person do. Um, I have a two-parter question, so put that aside now. As far as I, I, I'm often frustrated as someone who commutes back and forth across the state line as close as we are here. As far as I know, from what I understand and what people tell me, the uh, river basin isn't dictated by the state line. That was a joke. <laughs> um, and so, and then I see you have uh, a bowl up there of 3,000 acres. Um, and I wonder is, is part of the uh, problem with expanding around the Great Lakes the complexity of another state and then conversely that 3,000 acres is that a is that sustainable is not the word I'm looking for here is that actually doable on land that is available or has been targeted or have you even started that process or is that just a number you guys have thrown out of it? Yeah, so this is probably the best slide to look at in the context of that question. And um, specifically as it relates to the 3,000 acres, I mean, that, um, that's kind of a nice uh, round number. Um, and at the time, uh, in 2016 essentially, when we unveiled that strategic plan, we had the um, the east branch of the Little Calumet River corridor where we were looking at kind of protecting this whole river um, corridor and then a couple other uh, sites in particular, uh, largely Meadowbrook and then Ambler Flatwoods. We have done some prioritization with property and uh, those are the three existing project areas that we had in mind when we were talking about the 3,000 acres. And also the expansion into St. Joe, Stark, and Marshall County. So it's a little bit, I mean, we aspire, we would really like to have a physical presence in Stark and Marshall County, but we have not identified or determined um, exactly what site that might be. Um, and then with St. Joseph County, I think there's a lot of potential to uh, protect additional land around the bog and continue to partner uh, with folks in St. Joseph County. Um, and the one thing I didn't mention that's worth noting going back to how many land trusts are uh, in the state of Indiana, we have 22, and we like to say 22 active land trusts. If you look at this map, just to the south of our geography, south of the Kankakee, uh, Niches Land Trust, they're based in Lafayette. We partner with them, they're a great land trust. And if you go over to Elkhart County, there's Acres Land Trust, and they're based over in Noblesville and Fort Wayne. And then, and this is something that has been kind of a tendency with Indiana Land Trust, not all, uh, but going into Michigan really doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, there's Chickening Land Trust. Um, based in New Buffalo. You also have Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy. And then on the Illinois side, which is an entirely different dynamic altogether because there they have forest preserves. They protected huge swaths of land. And so their land trust might not necessarily um, 
focus so much on the ownership side like we do. Uh, and the, the big land trust in Chicago is open lands. And so they have lots of initiatives as a land trust, um, but the model is a little different than, than what you have at Sherwood. Does that kind of answer your question? Did you have another one or was? Well, I can okay. ask you questions all day long. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. What kind of activities would you do in partnering with Spicer Lake and, and Bendix and Tender Creeks and Serenity Parks? Yeah. So Served. yeah. So those properties, I they have specific programming, you know, through county parks and through uh, DNR. So. Um, we're not actively doing anything at those sites. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. Oh, I thought you said you were going to partner with them. Yeah, we're partnering with them on the conservation planning side in terms of how to prioritize properties uh, around those other, other preserves. And what we're hoping is, um, and Abby Kirkwood, some of you might know her, she's the superintendent of St. Joseph County Parks. We're hoping that in the, this fall, we can do uh, a bus tour that's uh, in partnership with county parks and maybe go to Bendix Woods or Spicer Lake and, and check out sites that are uh, owned and managed by Shirley Hines and county parks. So that's pretty exciting and something that you will likely see in the future. Yeah. Um, compared to national, other national or even like worldwide land trust funds, um, Really as well in terms of acreage, and also like who you look up to, who's you know kind of a veteran that really is the, the gold standard for land trusts. Say the last part of that again. Uh, who do you guys look up to for like land trusts and just how they go about business? And um, assuming you know, uh, yeah, who, who do you guys look up to? For your yeah, land trust account? yeah. So um, as it relates to where does Shirley Hines? Land trust fall on the spectrum. We're 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 a unique uh, land trust in a lot of ways because we don't have an expansive geography. We're not covering. Um, we don't have nearly as many counties as other land trusts just in the state of Indiana uh, does. But uh, so our sites are largely concentrated, and um, the acreage is significant in kind of this fragmented landscape that we're operating in. But if you go out west, I mean, there's some land trusts that have protected tens of thousands of acres. And they may use like the conservation easement model where they're protecting branch lands. And so we're unique in some ways uh, because of the way we protect land and also um, the fact that we do pretty intensive land management and have a stewardship program. And that probably is most closely aligned with the Nature Conservancy. So we, in some ways, like to think of ourselves as kind of the local TNC or the local Nature Conservancy uh, because we're um, very focused on protecting the highest quality natural areas. We give consideration uh, to uh, kind of landscape scale conservation, even though we're in a pretty fragmented landscape. And uh, stewardship, uh, staffing, um, of those six full-time staff I mentioned earlier, uh, three of them are specifically um, full-time for our stewardship program. Uh, so I don't have the best answer in terms of you know, who do we model ourselves after or where do we fit in the mix? Um, it's pretty, another thing that also makes us unique uh, relative to a lot of other organizations is we do, you know, some pretty significant environmental education programming. Um, and I didn't get into a lot of detail about, you know, our guided hike program. There's many other things that we do on the environmental education front, like the bus tours. So, does that help? Yep. Go. Oh, I was just wondering, uh, with any of your locations, do you do like fire blitzes at all? Um, yeah, yeah, so a few years ago, we um, 
the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, the National Parks Program, they actually do these big national bio blitzes, um, and we partnered with them on that. Um, and then locally, we, we talk about kind of having bio blitzes where we get more people out on the site to do identification. In fact, just last week we were having a conversation about uh, that uh, concept of having little mini bio blitzes at our sites. So it's a good suggestion and something that we need to do more of. Yeah? Um, you mentioned you have about 2,400 acres right now. Yeah. That 100 acres sort of an easement. Um, I guess I'm wondering what that 100 acres is. Is it like a, a sole proprietor as a single owner? And what is the Shirley Hines role in that, aside from the protected status? Can you go there and you know, clean up or yeah, so uh, the conservation, we have uh, nine conservation easements in total, and there are different uh, landowners that we have those conservation easements with. Um, and so the conservation easements are different than like where we actually own the land, be simple. And our obligation and commitment when we put a conservation easement on a piece of property is that one, we always uphold that conservation easement. So we, we have um, a commitment to making sure that property is always protected and we, we monitor the property annually. So um, that is something that uh, we do as a land trust. Uh, we're not necessarily actively removing invasive plants and doing prescribed burn management with those conservation easements. So, Kind of going back to what um, I talked about early on, it is um, our preference and kind of what we focus on generally is acquisition, um, and but in certain cases, conservation easements can be a good tool to uh, protect property. So we have one more question, but are you rushing off? Do you have to no, head up? So no, I... you can take one more official question and then he'll be hanging out yeah. and talk. Uh, so you mentioned that you you guys partnership um, and you value partnerships with institutions, governments, um, municipalities. Um, but I'm just interested if you work at all or if there's any interest to work with local Native American tribes um, to kind of even if it's just like acknowledgement of the land or um, like in collaboration with if that's yeah part of it. no that's a that's a great question. Um, so Jennifer uh, Kanine, who uh, manages natural resources for the Pokagon uh, Band of the Potawatomis, she's on our advisory council. And so we, um, we're very interested in partnering more um, and uh, working uh, with the Pokagons to uh, potentially protect more land and collaborate on how those natural resources are managed. Alright, so, so that will uh, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, so please don't leave without finding out more about upcoming events that Chris has going on to explore the incredible biodiversity of our area. And of course, there's more. We will not have a lecture next week. I might have mentioned something about spring break being next week. Uh, so we won't be here in like two weeks from tonight, though. Uh, we will be back. We're going to be hearing from uh, Marty Mechtenberg, and he does um, certifications on lead buildings around the planet. And so he's going to be sharing stories about successes and failures of global sustainability. So that should be very interesting because he's got a really broad based uh, perspective on that. So, anyway, there's more to come, but not next week. Uh, plenty of things to discover between now and then. So, uh, thanks again to Chris, and thank you all for coming up. Hope to see you back here soon.